All right, class. Uh, good morning and happy snow day. Um, seems like that we've just had, um, you know, so many snow days now. I um, it's getting to be a little bit old. That's for sure. Um, and then, of course, on top of uh, already the crazy week with the testing, and um, you know, I will. Um, pl I'm planning on being gone all of next week as well. So, um, you know, I apologize for the craziness, but um, thankfully. Uh, we can be using a little bit of technology here today to um, you know, to keep us a little bit on schedule, um, definitely as we round into the, the one of the busier parts of our year for sure. So, um, so you guys are joining me at home. Um, it is about eleven o'clock on um, Wednesday morning. So of course we are in the middle of our snow day right now. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, so you're uh, joining me in the den, otherwise known as my office. Um, so I'm going to give you a little lecture today, uh, and um, it'll be a little bit different, but um, I'm kind of looking forward to it, so we'll see. Um, a little bit of my Tom Ritchie is coming out, I think. So um, so yeah, I'm all set. I'm all cozy. Um, I hope you guys are um, maybe even watching this on, from your house on Wednesday. So if you are, sit on the couch, get a blanket, get cozy. Uh, I'm doing my best Tom Ritchie express, or, uh, um, impression. I've got my coffee right here. And um, just uh, as a, uh, I think you guys will enjoy this, but um, uh, the thing on snow days here at our households, our cats love them because they get to snuggle on us all day. Um, so if you look down here, you will see that my little cat right there is very angry because he's not getting snuggles right now. So he's sitting on the floor, sitting away from us, um, but he is our moral support as we do our lecture today. So um, without further ado, let's get right into um, the lecture stuff. So if you take a look at, um, uh, at the whiteboard right here or the iPad app that I'm kind of using as my whiteboard right here, um, just a few things of housekeeping for us before we get started. Uh, number one is that um, the LEQ will still be due on Friday, even though we have a snow day. Um, and um, I'm still planning to be gone on Thursday. So um, my, my plan for right now um, for Thursday is that we will use that as a study slash work day for you guys. Um, so you can complete this lecture uh, if you didn't do so already on Wednesday. Uh, you can study for the test, which will be on Friday. Um, you can take the quiz, which I will post up on Google Classroom for this. Um, so lots of things for you guys to do on, on Thursday to get caught up while I am giving the work keys assessment to the juniors. Um, number three, the test is still going to be on Friday, so come prepared. Um, that will be just like normal, so it'll, um, it'll have, you know, 20 multiple choice questions, you know, 20 to 25 multiple choice questions and, and um, an SAQ, so be prepared for that. Um, and then finally, uh, I know with the snow day craziness and then me being gone on Thursday, you guys might have questions or comments or concerns. Um, so I am still available by email and I will be in my classroom both before and after school. So um, you can contact me that way. So, all right, I think that's housekeeping aside. Um, go ahead and pull up your notes. Let's get started with the lecture. All right, so let's pull up and go back here to the beginning of the slide. Okay, um, so chapter 18 is the third chapter in um, our Gilded Age unit. And um, so we've already talked about our Conquest of the West chapters, where we talked about sort of the, the closing of the frontier in the Western areas. Um, and... Uh, um, you know, sort of the, the industries uh, that led to the settlement of the Western territories, you know, the mining, the ranching, the farming. Um, and then last chapter, we talked about industrialization, which was um, the, the second industrial ro uh, um, revolution and the, um, you know, the huge expansion that goes on in the American economy and the, um, the emergence of the new heavy industry technologies like steel and oil. Um, and we talked about how um, the fantastic rate of economic growth um, kind of does a few things. Um, it, it definitely raises the living standards of everybody, uh, but um, that the, the living standards go up at a far faster rate for that capitalist class than they do for the workers. So when you combine that, that sense of um, increasing wealth inequality with uh, um, the fact that you know corporations were drastically increasing in size and consolidating 
um, you know, this uh, definitely kind of led to some struggles and some issues uh, um, in the American population. Um, just because that, that fantastic rate of economic growth, while it provided lots of good things, also um, um, created some tension as well. So um, where we're going to move to this chapter is um, talking about urbanization, which is really closely related to the Industrial Revolution. Um, in that uh, it, it's both going to be caused by industrialization and industrialism, and it's going to cause further industrialism and industrialization too. So, um, so this trend, the urbanization trend, is going to be really closely related to industrialism. So, um, so let's go ahead and get started here. All right, so looking at this overview slide right here, uh, the time frame is the same time frame that we have been talking about in um, our previous two chapters as well. So we're pretty much looking at, um, you know, after the end of the Civil War and up until right around the year 1900. So some historians place it at the year 1900, some historians place it at 1910, some historians even place it all the way at the beginning of World War I, which happens in 1914. Um, Regardless, we have about 30 to 40 years here, right at the end of the 1800s. And the, the critical thing that we're looking at here is um, that due to a, a variety of factors, um, perhaps most importantly, immigration and industrialization, so our two I terms, um, cities all across the Western world explode in size in the late 19th century. So um, they are just going to mushroom in size and population. Uh, this trend although it takes place in all Western countries, so Britain, France, Germany, everywhere, it's going to be especially stark in the United States um, because we here in this country, up until this point, hadn't had a whole lot of experience with really large urban centers. So um, the impact of, uh, um, of this uh, urban growth is kind of going to be, you know, especially startling for us here in the United States. Um, the impact of high amounts of immigration made the growth of U.S. urban centers especially unique. Uh, the growth of cities came with many changes, right? So, of course, when you go to mostly, uh, or go from, rather, a mostly rural, agrarian sort of country to a country that is primarily urban, that's going to be a big change in your culture and the way your society functions. Um, and uh, this is going to result in some good things, uh, but also some struggles, right? Of course, um, <laughs> that's a familiar um, thing for me to say, and I'm sure that's frustrating for you who like um, clear black and white delineations. But of course, this is going to create good things and problems for us, too. So, all right, let's hop right in, guys. I'm going to take a quick drink of coffee. I feel like I have to start talking in a, a southern accent, kind of like Tom Ritchie when I do that. But, okay, here we go. So the first section of your textbook is uh, um, titled The Urbanization of America. So here it's going to talk about some of the, the causes of the, this trend of urbanization. So, um, of course, for, for those of you who aren't aware, um, the term urbanization means um, the, the, uh, a population trend that has to do with a really big city. So when we talk about urban centers today, typically we're talking about, you know, really big cities. Like, um, you know, I would consider New York City urban. I would consider Chicago urban. Um, Madison, I would even consider urban to an extent. Um, something like Dubuque, I don't know if I would consider urban. Um, and Platteville, I, I, I wouldn't consider urban. Um, so, so something very big city, right, with, um, with the amenities that you can't get in, in most other towns. Now, um, back in the 1800s, they considered anything urban that was um, a city of 2,500 or more. So that was the, the, the technical definition of urban back in this time frame. Um, and the, the population in these urban centers, right, these cities with 25 all right, sorry about that, guys. Uh, my computer went to sleep on me, so it cut off the lecture. So we were um, kind of talking about the um, the population of these urban centers or these cities with um, 2,500 residents or more. That is going to increase sevenfold. Um, so uh, that's not top. Uh, that's not talking about the entire population of the United States. It's simply referring to the number of Americans living in an urban setting. So that's going to increase sevenfold, which is a huge, huge increase. Um, the, the cities that are especially going to balloon in size are going to be cities like Chicago, 
um, which is going to go from about 100,000 residents to um, over a million residents. And then New York City, which is going to go from about 1 million residents to about 3 million residents in 40 years. So um, that is a huge explosion in the size of these cities in like three to, to four decades. Um, now, uh, one of the interesting things to note about um, the, the uh, growth in the population in these cities and about U.S. population growth in general is that um, the, the population growth among native-born Americans was actually starting to flatline at this time. So it, it, was, it, um, it wasn't growing as quickly as it had been in the past. Um, so the most important driver of this huge population growth wasn't the native-born population, it was actually immigrants. So um, the, the immigration at this point is actually going to start to increase really heavily, and this is going to be one of the biggest periods of immigration that we get in American history. Um, so if you look at that graph over on the right-hand side of the slide, um, an interesting thing that you're going to see, um, uh, um, in addition to the numbers of immigrants going up, is that if you look uh, um, kind of in the upper left-hand corner of that graph, where it says like Eastern European, Italian, other Central European, that quarter of the graph, roughly, uh, really wouldn't have been there, uh, you know, uh, before the Civil War. So not only is are the numbers of immigrants going to go up uh, in the late 1800s, but the sources of immigration are going to start to change a little bit as well. And um, so most of the immigration is still going to remain from traditional sources in northern and western Europe. So um, places like Germany and um, the British Isles, uh, Ireland, that's still going to form the bulk of immigration in the United States. But more and more as we get you know, closer to the year 1900 and past the year 1900, um, we are going to get sources from southern and eastern Europe, right? So um, places like Italy and Greece and um, the uh, Slovakia, Herzegovina, um, uh, places like that where that are, are culturally uh, quite a bit different than what they are in northern and western Europe. So, um, so the, the type of immigration, the source of immigration is going to change. And um, interestingly enough, uh, the, the immigrants from these locations are, yeah, are um, they're seen as less desirable than the immigrants from northern and western European countries. They tend to be poorer, they tend to be less uh, educated, so the, the Americans who are already living here have an even more adverse reaction to immigrants from southern and eastern Europe than they do to immigrants in northern and western Europe. Okay. Um, so in addition to immigrants, uh, um, one of the big drivers of the increase in population in cities are going to be women and blacks. And um, the, the big reason that you're going to see lots of women and blacks move to the cities is because they're going to provide them opportunity um, that they wouldn't get were they living in their rural settings. So um, I mean this in both the economic sense uh, in, in that they can move to the city um, because of the, the advancing mechanization and technology in farming. Um, a lot of the roles that women and blacks had been filling on farms were um, being replaced with technology. So they were moving to the city to find new types of jobs, uh, but they were also um, moving to the city for cultural reasons as well. Um, Women who were living in cities uh, could act in a, um, a more open, um, even perhaps a little bit more promiscuous manner um, in, in ways that would s seem um, very um, improper in their sort of uh, their, their rural settings, right? Um, so, and, and blacks, of course, were, were doing the same. They could um, uh, move to the, the cities and start to live amongst a, a more concentrated black community um, and away from a lot of the Jim Crow type stuff that was going on in the South. So, so when you put all this together, I'm kind of looking down to the third bullet point from the bottom. Um, American cities were incredibly diverse, ethnically speaking. So you um, had, a, 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 of course, a large native-born population, but especially in these cities that were growing really rapidly, um, you had all these different groups that were coming to the cities, you know, the, the ethnicities, the women, the blacks. Um, you even start to see uh, um, pockets of um, like gay uh, communities start to happen in these cities. Um, and so the American cities, especially compared to cities like London or Paris, tended to be very, very ethnically diverse. 
um, if I'm remembering from the the textbook, I think they said um, cities like like New York were even majority uh, um, ethnic. So like the majority of New York population was born outside of New York City, which is kind of crazy to think about. Chicago was something like 90% born outside the city, uh, which is really interesting and, and unique for American cities. Um, so uh, the fact that so many immigrants were... Uh, um, residing in these big cities um, did create quite a bit of tension, uh, culturally speaking. So the immigrants did have um, many desires to assimilate. So uh, um, kind of the common idea for many of these Americans coming to the United States was that they were really, um, they, they greatly desired the opportunity that the United States would perform, um, would afford to them or, or at least that was their perception, was that there was going to be, you know, that uh, the United States would be this land of opportunity for them. And um, it wasn't something that they just wanted to exploit either. They truly wanted to embrace being American. And so that's one of the reasons why, um, you know, I, I'm sure you guys know what like Ellis Island is. When these immigrants come over and get processed by the, the Ellis Island station, a lot of them will change their names from what um, their names used to be in the old country to an Americanized version of that, right? So, of course, you have like the German Mueller, uh, which is like M-U-E-L-L-E-R, gets changed to the Americanized Miller, M-I-L-L-E-R, right? So you have lots of instances of that where immigrants do want to assimilate to the American culture. Um, but also many of them wanted to retain aspects of their culture as well. Um, and you, I think your textbook especially notes um, attitudes regarding like young women. So um, many immigrant families, for instance, come from societies where, um, you know, marriages were arranged and uh, women were definitely kept in the sheltering confines of the family unit. Um, and so they, certain aspects of certain cultures wanted to retain that as well. So, um, so kind of regardless, right, uh, whether these immigrants were successful in assimilating or not successful in assimilating, um, nativist sentiment did rise in the late 1800s in reaction to all of this new immigration. So, um, you know, many of the native born Americans were, were, were quite a bit put off by this new wave of, uh, um, of immigration. So, all right, next slide. So, um, the growth in, in cities and the explosion of the cities, you know, the sevenfold increase in cities is going to um, have a huge effect on the way that cities looked and functioned and were built. So, um, the, the landscape of urban centers changes quite a bit in the United States in the late 1800s. And um, one of the funny things that I, 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 well, I find funny about this anyway, is that um, many of these huge cities that just, you know, balloon in size, there was no urban planning given to how these cities are going to go about that. So a lot of these cities just sort of grow and expand haphazardly with no central planning. And when I mean no central planning, I mean like no central planning, right? So like, um, if you take like Platteville today, um, you know, we have plans for, you know, if they're going to add a subdivision onto the city, we think about like plumbing, we think about electrical utilities, we think about environmental impact. They didn't think about any of this stuff, right? So no thought to the water processing in these cities or sanitation or anything like that. They just kind of grew, right? So the, the expansion of the cities in the 1800s was really, really haphazard. Um, as these cities start to expand too, you also get a greater separation of where people live based on what their um, wealth level was. So um, these cities tend to be more striated by class, right? So if you go into different parts of the city, you can tell what class of person lives there. Um, and that that's largely due to economics. So um, this is pretty easy to think about, right? If you think about like... Um, um, real estate prices. Of course, the most expensive real estate is going to be right in the city center, right? That's that's the way it is today. That's the way it always has been. So the people who own houses right in the city center tend to be your really wealthy um, upper class or 1% or capitalist class, right? Like these monopolists. Um, and they often live in these gigantic, like palatial houses in the middle of the city, right? Um, if you want to see some of these huge houses, just Google um, uh, Vanderbilt's house in New York City. Uh, one of the biggest houses ever built in New York City, and it's huge. And the fact that it was in the middle of the city just 
the cost of that must have just been astronomical. Um, so the, the, the wealthiest people tended to live in the middle of the cities. And um, the upper middle class, or sort of the, the professional class, so the people who were like doctors or lawyers or um, middle managers in your corporations, right? Sort of these white collar type workers. Um, these people who had enough money to own a house but couldn't necessarily afford something in the middle of the city tended to move to the outskirts of the city where land was a little bit cheaper. Um, and so that's where you start to get the growth of this brand new type of living situation, which were the suburbs. So the suburbs, you, we, we start to see for the first time in the late 1800s. Um, finally, the, the lowest class, the working or the poor class, so these people who were working factory jobs, um, or, you know, were really, you know, these people were right at the poverty line or below them, they were living in the city center not in the same parts as the really wealthy people, you know, so different neighborhoods. Um, but these people, of course, couldn't, you know, they didn't make enough money to afford their own house, so they had to rent. And, of course, um, back in the 1800s, these, these um, apartments tended to be much lower quality than an apartment that we would see today. Um, and the worst of these apartments uh, were called the tenements. And New York City especially was known for having lots of tenements and really low quality tenements. So um, what a tenement was, was a really big apartment complex. And the condition of these apartments were really, really atrocious, right? So for example, if you, that, that picture over on the left or the right hand side of the screen rather, that's a picture of what living conditions were like in these tenement buildings. So oftentimes uh, um, an apartment in these big tenement apartment um, um, buildings, they were like one room, one or two rooms, um, a whole families or even groups of families would be lived. So often, you know, they would live in these rooms. So often you would have like eight to 10 people living in one room, you know, these cramped little rooms. Um, you can see how, how, how much stuff they have fit in there. Um, they were dirty, they were ramshackle. Oftentimes these tenements, well, I shouldn't say oftentimes, um, rarely did they have indoor plumbing, right? So no indoor water, oftentimes no indoor heating, so they're freezing. Um, of course, no indoor plumbing, so if, like waste. Um, oftentimes these tenements would be, um, they would have like a hollow interior of the building, like a courtyard sort of thing. And so your waste, um, you don't flush it, you actually take your waste in the bucket and you just dump it right into this courtyard. Um, so they were, uh, um, you know, disease ridden, um, they were gross, uh, and um, oftentimes they were fire hazards because they would be made of the cheapest material possible, like wood. So um, they were, they were just really bad places, right? Um, and sort of these breeding grounds for, for crime and poverty. And um, uh, so this was kind of, you know, when we talk about the fact that, you know, living standards were going up for many Americans, that was the case. But, um, you know, many Americans, uh, the, the majority, I would even say, couldn't afford something, you know, uh, uh, maybe I should say the majority living in the cities couldn't afford anything better than these tenements, right? So when you live in a tenement, like in that picture on the right-hand side of the screen, and you walk down four blocks in New York City and you see the Vanderbilt Mansion, definitely that contributes to, to this tension between, you know, the, the, um, the upper class and the working class, right? So um, that's an interesting uh, effect you get from urbanization is this, this better awareness of wealth inequality. So... Um, so the, the pictures that I'm showing you, both the picture on the right hand side of the screen and way back at the beginning of the chapter, um, right here, um, these are uh, all taken by a guy named Jacob Reese. Um, and Jacob Reese is a, uh, um, a Dutch photographer who dedicated sort of his life's work to cataloging and showcasing these slums in urban cities. And so he becomes a really popular artist for that reason. Um, so, um, with, uh, the, the growth and size of these cities, of course, the, um, uh, the population density in these cities also drastically increases too. So, um, the, the, um, the people living in these cities have to come up with ways of getting around to deal with this urban congestion. 
Um, so this is where we get some of the first mass transit systems, um, such as in 1870, the elevated railway in New York City. So um, like your, your trams that are elevated on tracks that go above the, um, uh, above the streets. And then in 1897, of course, the first subway happens in Boston, um, and then it pr proliferates throughout the other cities. Um, you, we also get the, the birth of the first skyscraper as well. Um, so, of course, this is kind of a direct impact of expensive property prices in the city center. You know, it's building these buildings that are um, short but very wide, you know, these big warehouse type buildings is really expensive because land is expensive per square foot. So rather than spending a lot on per square foot land building out, you, of course, build up. So you get the first skyscrapers start to happen in the 1800s as well. So, um... Uh, another interesting thing is that um, skyscrapers were largely driven by industrialization, too. Um, so the, the, we talked about steel, right? The fact that steel is both lighter and way stronger than iron. Um, so the fact that the, you have this new industrial material called steel means that you could build these structures that were really tall um, and that were strong enough to support that weight. So um, for those of you on your LEQ, if you're looking for both causes and effects of um, cities, steel is one of a really good one to talk about, right? Um, because steel plays into a skyscraper, which is both a cause and effect of industrialization and urbanization. Okay, moving on. Okay, so, um, so the growth in the size of cities creates many problems as well as good things too. So um, uh, um, talking about some of these problems that you get in these big cities, um, the strains of urban life. Um, one of the huge problems that you get are fire and disease. So, um, you know, many of the buildings that pop up in these cities, the goal was to get them built as quickly as possible and not necessarily to build them really in high quality. So a lot of these buildings that you get are built of wood still, um, even in the midst of the second industrial revolution. Um, and you also didn't have organized like, um, fire uh, departments at this time. So fire is a huge problem uh, for these big cities in the 1800s. And of course, um, I already talked to you about like the tenements and the fact that people would get rid of their waste by throwing them into the courtyards or on the street. Um, a lot of the times, you know, industrial waste and human waste goes right into the streams and the water supply um, because they don't organize these um, these waste management systems. So cities were very polluted and um, because of the population density and just the lack of waste management, um, disease spreads really rampantly. So you have tons of disease problems in these cities as well. Um, and then just general environmental degradation problems as well. Um, because of course, when you don't have good management of trash um, or uh, you know regulations that talk about what um, factories can and can't do with their waste, uh, this contributes to, you know, just tons of trash and waste and that sort of thing. Um, there's kind of this popular anecdote about the Chicago River catching fire in the late 1800s. Um, so if you can imagine how degraded and polluted a river has to be to catch fire, um, that's terrifying. So um, uh, another thing that you see a lot in these cities is urban poverty, which is an especially big problem because... Um, Urban poverty is kind of this, this um, you know, well, if you're poor and you live in the country, typically you can still hunt for your food. You can grow your food, right? You still have land and things to do. Um, you can, uh, um, you have space, right? But if you're poor in the city, um, you, it's really hard to feed yourself because you need money to buy the food that you need. Um, you are typically just kind of stuck being in the city, right? So, um, so being poor in an urban setting is sort of especially dehumanizing and, and humiliating. Um, and the fact that, that um, uh, the, the cities tended to have a greater concentration of the poor people meant that these masses of um, people living below the poverty line um, was a, uh, you know, the, the great numbers of these people all living in one place was a problem unique to the big cities. Um, another thing that you get popping up in the late 1800s um, in the cities is political corruption. Um, and this tends to come in the most notable form as um, uh, in, in something we call the political machine. Um, 
which is led by somebody called a political boss. So a machine is an organization that dedicates itself to controlling the political process by whatever means it can. So a really typical way that a political machine would exercise control over urban politics is they would go to these urban poor or these immigrants and um, uh, like a representative of this organization would go down to like the immigrant docks and they would find these, these, um, uh, um, these people who needed support and they'd say, hey, I know you're in need of a job. I know you're in need of a, um, a place to live. Uh, and I know you're in need of money. I can get you all these things, right? Come with me and I will find you a place to live. I will find you a job. But in exchange for this, um, you need to vote for who I tell you to vote at the next election, right? So it's essentially these political machines will help out these people, but they're really bribing them for votes. So then what they turn around and do, of course, is that they, they designate who these um, people who they're bribing, who these people are going to vote for. So they select candidates for political office. And of course, when these candidates win a majority of the votes um, and get into political office, they are beholden to the political machine, right? So the political machine controls the votes and through the votes, they control the politicians. Now, um, this is uh, um, a really good situation because when these politicians are in power, of course, the, you know, the, the political machine puppet masters will tell these politicians how they're going to vote on legislation. So when the rules are made, these rules often go towards enriching these political machines. So they're, um, they're really tough organizations to break because they are able to control the political process through bribery and blackmail. Um, the best known political machine um, was um, actually this guy, the, the, the picture on the right hand side of the screen. Um, was Tammany Hall, and this was in New York City. And the guy that was in charge of Tammany Hall was the, the dude in this picture who was Boss Tweed. So Boss Tweed exercised an enormous amount of power, not just in New York City in the state of New York, um, but on a national level as well. And Boss Tweed was part of the Democratic Party, so he's a Democratic political machine. Um, but you see these political machines pop up in all sorts of locations, um, you know, in, in, in these urban centers. I mean, they're definitely sort of a facet of urban political life and a, a problem at that. Um, okay, so moving on to the next slide, another thing that we see is um, the, uh, um, the changing spending patterns and consumption patterns for people who live in the city. So whereas the previous slide was all about problems of living in the city, this slide is a little bit more focused on the good things that pop up. Um, so uh, people that move to these big urban centers, of course, are, are going to have access to more types of stores and more ways to spend their money than people who would be living in urban uh, or sorry, rural settings. So um, patterns of income and consumption start to change for these Americans living in these big cities. So um, one of the interesting things that you see um, uh, and again, if you're looking for like causes and effects of urbanization, this is a really good topic to talk about, um, is um, the Industrial revol uh, Revolution, talk um, increasing um, incomes and living standards, and then changing patterns of mass consumption, which are going to change the way stores function in the city. So this is a really good topic to talk about in your LEQ. Um, one of the things that you see start to pop up in cities are chain stores. So rather than stores with one location, you see these stores that start to expand to lots of different places, right? Um, you also see um, something interesting called mail order stores as well. So stores who um, have a traditional storefront that you go to, but they'll also start to send out um, these catalogs to people as well. Um, Sears Roebuck was actually the really famous one about like, like the store Sears, right? The department store Sears that you go to, they actually started as a mail order store where they would send out these big, like hundred page thick catalogs to people. And you could look in these catalog and find out, you know, you could buy everything from like fans. Um, you know, you can kind of see in that picture that's, uh, um, uh, uh, one of the pages on these Sears catalog, you buy everything from like fans to radios to um, to like grain and seeds to sewing machines. You could even buy like prefab houses on the Sears um, uh, catalog. But people would take a look at these catalogs, what they want, and then at the end of the catalog, they would write down, you know, I want this item from page ninety six, and enclosed is this amount of cash for this item. Um, how you would enclose the cash for buying a house from the Sears catalog? 
I don't know. Um, but uh, so you have mail order stores as well that would sell things by sending out these mail catalogs to people. They would fill them out, mail them back to the department store. The department store would take the money and then um, you know they would deliver these items to the houses as well. Um, Okay, you also started to see department stores as well. Um, so the growth in the size of stores as well. So a department store is a store that doesn't just specialize in one type of thing like groceries or clothes. They kind of start to, 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 to have lots of different items under these big, um, these big storefronts as well. So these bigger stores, the size of stores starts to increase. Um, so that's a change in the type of consumption as well. Um, because of the Industrial Revolution and the fact that, um, you know, we've talked about the spheres of influence, right? The, the fact that men go out to earn the money and it's women's sphere to sort of operate as the homemakers. Um, one interesting thing that happens to um, women and their gender roles is that um, because it's their role to make the, the house, they sort of assume this role as a consumer, right? They're, they are sort of seen as the target market for these bigger stores, right? So oftentimes like the mail order catalogs, for instance, the ads in those will target women explicitly. Um, so, so women are, are sort of the key consumer demographic in, in an urban setting in the late 1800s. Um, Another thing that you see in a, a way that consumption changes in the late 1800s is that leisure time increases as well. So the farther we get in the 1800s, the more companies um, and factories especially start to lower the, the um, number of hours in a workday. So they, um, instead of working like 12 hours a day, many people are starting to work like eight hours a day. And they start having things like um, weekends, right? Uh, which is a really novel concept. Um, and like two weeks paid vacation. So leisure time starts to increase for many Americans in the late 1800s as well. Um, and that goes along with this, this second industrial revolution. Um, so there was this conception um, because of, um, incomes were going up for most Americans, leisure time was going up for most Americans. Um, and uh, there was this conception that we were going from a, a society of scarcity where most people were kind of just getting by to society of um, a, an economy of pleasure rather, which is where people have enough income to buy things that they really like and not just, you know, they're not just limited to things that they need. So um, a few things that you see with that is um, spectator sports. So like baseball starts to become a thing in the late 1800s. Um, you get um, vaudeville and ethnic theater. So um, live theater and variety shows uh, start to become a thing in the late 1800s. And um, you also get the first movies, which are of course silent movies. Um, but uh, um, you know, the, the moving picture, the motion picture is a popular form of entertainment that happens in the, the 1800s and or the late 1800s. And of course, if you lived in these tiny little rural towns, no way you're gonna support something like a vaudeville or uh, um, movie theaters. So, um, so you know, the, these are interesting effects uh, on, um, or, or yeah, effects of urbanization too, right? Is the, the changing notions of sort of pop culture and consumption culture, that sort of thing. These are all things that change because of urbanization. Okay, so getting onto our last slide here, we are almost done, you've almost made it. Um, culture in the age of the city. So um, one of the ways that you see culture start to change in, in urban settings in the late 1800s is that um, the cities, because they are so industrial and so gray, and in my mind, I kind of think of almost like a steampunk type situation, um, art and literature start to reflect that the industrial and urban and gray and um, uh, that sort of aspect of life. And, and art and literature try to mimic that. So you get something called realism and modernism in art and literature that try to reflect sort of the, um, the gray, dull, um, industrial lifestyle that many Americans were living in these industrial big cities. So um, uh, rather than being romance, uh, you know, romantic or painting landscapes or lots of color, they are very like stark and dreary and strong. And that, that's kind of how culture and art changes in the 1800s. Um, another big thing uh, 
that you see in the late 1800s are these new intellectual traditions, um, the most famous of which is Darwinism and um, evolution. And the emergence of these new intellectual traditions really creates a wedge between these people who are living in the big cities who, for whatever reason, tend to be more receptive to new intellectual traditions. Um, and they start to become more cosmopolitan and um, liberal and open to change um, in, in embracing of new ideas. Um, and they start to separate themselves intellectually from the people who are living in a more urban setting where things are tend to be a little bit more traditional and um, you know, uh, more the way they have been, right? So this divide between cosmopolitan people who live in the big cities and the um, you know, more conservative people who live in the countryside starts to emerge in the late 1800s. Finally, and this is the last bullet point, I promise, um, in the late 1800s, we see um, an increase in public education. So there's a big push by many people in the late 1800s to create universal public education paid for by tax money. So um, the, the amount of uh, um, Americans who receive at least an eighth grade education skyrockets in the late 1800s. And a big factor in this is um, this thing called the Moral Land Grant Act, which is an act passed in the midst of the Civil War. Um, but the, what the Moral Land Grant Act does is it takes land that was owned by federal or state governments and it allows the sale, excuse me, the sale of this land. And the money that's raised by selling public land then gets used to build schools and especially um, um, uh, like public uh, universities, right? So, so secondary insti uh, higher institutions of learning. Um, so you see tons of universities pop up across the country from these land grant sales, and they, they call them these moral land grant colleges. Um, I can't remember off the top of my head, but I think UW Madison is an example of one of these land grant colleges. Um, so uh, public in education increases in the late 1800s as well. So. All right, ladies and gents, I think that's it. Um, I will leave the lecture for right there. I know I'm hitting just about my 50, 55 minute time. So I'll leave the lecture right there. Um, I can't think of anything else to tell you. Um, once again, just a reminder of our housekeeping, LEQ due Friday. I'm gonna be gone on Thursday. So plan on um, having a study work day on Thursday. Um, you will be in the commons on Thursday because uh, juniors will be testing in my room. So report to the, the commons. Mrs. Woodworth will be your sub. Um, test Friday, so come prepared for that. And then finally, you can always contact me by email um, or stop by my room either before or after school. All right? Thanks, guys. See you Friday. Happy snow day.